Uh, my name is Josh Wills. Uh, my friend here is John Gallagher. We work on search at Slack. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, how we've rebuilt Slack search. Um, not quite from the ground up, but like pretty close to it over the course of about a year or so. A uh, little bit about me before we get going. I've been at Slack for three years. Uh, I'm an engineer in the search infrastructure team. Um, I am a recovering uh, engineering director. Uh, so I was spent my first couple of years at Slack as the director of engineering for data. Um, I was a director of data science at Cloudera before that. I was at Google before that. I was in Indeed before that. Um, amazingly, I've never actually worked on search before working on search at Slack, despite working in all these places that like you know do a lot of search stuff. Um, and it's been just like super super fun. I really really enjoy search. It's like the best thing ever. So uh, so yeah. John. And uh, here, I'll oh, you, uh, you take that, that from me. Okay. Yeah, sure. Why not. All right, cool. Um, I'm John Gallagher. I work, luckily, with Josh on the SLI search infrastructure team. Uh, before that, I worked on search and infrastructure stuff at Foursquare. And before that, I worked uh, a bit at Microsoft. But uh, today, here, we're uh, talking about Slack. So, as a show of hands, like, how many people are familiar with Slack? Yeah, do we need to explain Slack to people? Okay, no, okay. good. Largely then this no. part will be like extremely brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Slack is a collaboration hub. You can like use it, you know, with your team members to coordinate work. And for the purposes of this talk, you can use it to generate lots and lots of searchable content um, in the form of messages and files and a few other things, but mostly messages. Um, and whatever you're using it for, people seem to like to use it. So we have like more than 8 million daily active users and growing. Uh, there are teams like from really, really tiny hackathons that like use it once and then like abandon that team to like really, really large enterprise customers with Hundreds lots and lots and lots yeah. of users. Yeah. Um, so like it's a really diverse customer base to try to like deliver a successful search experience to. Yeah. Um, and this is sort of what the search experience looks like, right? Like it used to be kind of squished on that sidebar, and then uh, most recently, um, we expanded it out into like a you know its own pane. Um, there's more room here for other things like being able to refine your search and drill down by users and channels and all that kind of stuff. And you'll see kind of how that ties into like the rich document structure that uh, we'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, and then the other thing that I want to say is uh, basically, even though this looks like a fairly standard type of search result page. Um, Slack and search is a little bit different than web search. Uh, for one, every user on Slack has their own like uniquely accessible document set of things that they're able to access, right? Um, so it's not like web search where there's like a really common corpus. Uh, and it's not quite like email because there is a lot of commonality within public channels in your team where uh, many people are able to see the same documents. So usually when we're thinking about queries, we're thinking about them from like a team perspective, uh, even though each user kind of has a unique set of results. Um, the other thing that's a little bit different about it is um, like similar to Twitter or whatever, um, documents aren't like very durable on Slack, like messages aren't very durable on Slack. What might be relevant this week while you're working on like some status update for a given project or whatever, may not really be relevant by next week, by like you know the time that next week rolls around and that project is like defunct or you've moved on or whatever it is. Um, it's not like people are like writing Wikipedia articles into Slack that people constantly keep referring to. It would be nice maybe if they did it that way. Um, okay. Yeah, write your messages thinking with search in mind. Um, and then finally. Uh, there aren't a lot of head queries, um, so we can't really optimize from that perspective. Um, even within a team, we did like a little bit of analysis and saw, even though we don't look at the queries themselves, uh, but we saw that like there is like a repeat of tokens like only a few times every month. Um, so like you know you can't really just cache the head and expect that to like serve like twenty to you know forty percent of your search results. So we have to kind of think about that while we're working on the architecture. Um, and now I will. Hand it back over to Josh to talk wow. a little bit about how those messages and other content get indexed. Passing the proverbial baton, yes. Uh, so I want to give you all a little bit of background on how Slack works at a, at a pretty high level um, to set the context for how search works and so on and so forth. Um, sort of fairly obviously, messages get indexed after you send them and after Slack finds out about them. Um, and the way that works is you are at your computer typing away, you know, slash Giphy, Haha, ha, funny cat image, whatever it is you type, 
Um, that gets fired off to our web server infrastructure, um, first and foremost, which will persist the message, uh, excuse me, which will relay the message over to uh, what we call the message server industrial complex, which is a set of services that is responsible for delivering messages to all the other people on your team. And there's a bunch of like crazy cool stuff going on back there. It's not all Kafka like you would think. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, we will persist the message to MySQL um, so that it's durable, and if you come along later and fetch like the history of the channel or something like that, we have a copy of it lying around somewhere. So that's like basically what happens when you send a message. Um, at the same time, um, after we've persisted the message to MySQL, uh, we stick a job in our job queue industrial complex. Um, our job queue is also like kind of a very interesting system in and of itself, um, which we say, hey, job queue, we need you to uh, we need you to update our search index with the contents of this message that someone just posted. So that job will get picked up by one of our job workers. Um, the job worker will do a whole bunch of queries to our MySQL backend in order to construct the solar input document that we end up passing off to solar. So the idea with the document is we kind of want like a 360 degree view of a message. We want to know uh, the, obviously the text of the message itself, the name of the author, the name of the channel, um, any React Gs, any stars, any pins. Um, additionally, we, we do this sort of like shingling thing. We call it shingling. It's like a poor man's conversational indexing, where in addition to indexing the content of the message in the document, we also index the content of the previous two messages in the channel um, along with it. So if you have like terms that are across a set of messages in a kind of small conversation, we'll be able to retrieve the document later when you go looking for it. All right. Um, so once we've constructed that solar input document, uh, we fire off a request to solar to actually index the document. Um, the basic structure, the basic flow here has been this way for at least four years, roughly speaking, like since 2014. Like a lot of the individual kind of components and steps have changed and evolved, but the basic flow um, works more or less as I described here. Um, the Slack, sorry, the Slack search and the solar box that we're talking about right there is the thing that we're like gonna mostly be focused on today. Um, originally, back in 2014, uh, this was a solar four, uh, a set of solar four shards. And the way it worked is whenever a team was created, um, we would statically assign that team to a MySQL shard and to uh, a solar shard. And all of the messages and all the queries for that team would then be routed to that shard for all time, forever and ever, um, so on and so forth. Um, as you can imagine, uh, there were some problems with doing this. Um, one of the big ones being that teams grew, uh, like, like John said, we have very, very small teams. We also have very, very large teams. Um, for the very, very large teams, they would be writing like a lot of messages to their shards um, and potentially like leading to this sort of very, very broad, um, somewhat terrible distribution of the size of the index um, on all of the different shards. There was like sort of a very simple solar four based replication strategy we could use for failover and stuff like that. But generally speaking, um, almost all these instances were primarily indexing messages. Like our write rate is like 100 times our, our query rate, roughly speaking. We're a heavy, heavy ingest load oriented search system, as you can imagine. Um, and as a result, most of the resources in the boxes were devoted to indexing, not querying. Um, whenever we wanted to scale things, we basically had to scale vertically. We had like no other choice. Um, so running the system was like really kind of incredibly expensive. Um, it was like I think at one point second only to our MySQL infrastructure in terms of the cost it took to run. Um, and we broadly were not happy with the performance and we were also not happy with our ability to like evolve the index or do anything kind of interesting, add new features, add new indexing strategies. Um, simply because the cost of refeeding all of Slack's messages using our online job queue system um, would have just taken months and months and months to do um, and would have been very failure prone and so on and so forth. So, Bunch of different problems we have with this old architecture. Um, we got a team together in like early 2017 uh, and decided to go about fixing this sort of stuff. Um, and so that's like largely the story we want to talk about today, um, how we launched Slack's new search backend. Okay. Uh, in making this kind of like major sort of technological evolution, you have to make a bunch of choices early on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the choices we made. These were not necessarily like the right choices or the one only true way to do things. It was just what was best for us or at least what we thought would be best for us like at the time we were making the decision. So I try to explain this stuff in, in, in that context. Um, first and foremost, we were running Solar 4. Uh, the very first decision we had to make was should we migrate to Solar Cloud 
should we migrate to Elasticsearch uh, or should we build our own search infrastructure thing uh, a la Nautilus or, or something along those lines? Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, we, ended up, we ended up choosing to migrate to Solar Cloud. Um, first and foremost, migrating to Solar Cloud meant that we would have to rewrite uh, the like, sort of minimal amount of query and indexing logic from our web application, which is all written in uh, PHP slash hack. We didn't need to rewrite our indexing infrastructure. We didn't need to rewrite our query infrastructure because all that stuff would work exactly the same um, on Solar 4 and on Solar 7, which is what we ended up migrating to. Um, number two, uh, we'd had some experience with Elasticsearch on the team. We'd had some experience with Solar Cloud on the team, like a little bit of both. Uh, we didn't strongly feel like there was uh, like a compelling enough difference in the feature sets between the two, between Elasticsearch and Solar Cloud, to justify one or the other. Like basically anything you could do in Elasticsearch, we felt like you could do in Solar Cloud, and, and vice versa. Sure, it might require some work, it might require some coding, but there was like no real sort of major functional difference that really kind of concerned us. Um, and then I'm trying to think, was there anything else that like we factored into it? Like, am I fitting, forgetting anything? It was it was basically like the path of least resistance, yeah. uh -huh. broadly speaking, right? Yeah, okay, fair. So that was like decision number one, migrate to Solar Cloud as our sort of indexing system of the future. Uh, second thing we did, uh, we decided to invest in building an offline indexing pipeline. So the vast majority of Slack's messages uh, are now constructed via an, like a MapReduce pipeline that builds an offline index um, using snapshots of our database uh, that our, our very awesome data engineering team, I'm, I mean, I'm somewhat biased, I used to manage them. Um, built for us, so we can take basically backups of our MySQL system, copy all the data we need into S3, and then kick off a long series of MapReduce pipelines that ends with solar shards that we can then load up into our index. Um, and we do this every week now. Bunch of different reasons for doing this. Um, one, we had like the sort of data engineering infrastructure and resources available to make doing this relatively straightforward for us to do. Like kicking off this project was not like a really big deal. We didn't have to go rewrite snapshotting infrastructure. We didn't have to like learn how to spin up clusters or write MapReduce jobs. We had a team of people who knew how to do it. Um, the other thing was we were, at least I don't know about you, I was reasonably sure we would screw up a bunch of stuff in the process of, of doing this migration to Solar Cloud. And so the option to be able to rebuild the index offline in a couple of days without putting any additional load on our online system was like a broadly appealing quality to like doing this kind of stuff. And that, that turned out to pay off in the end. So yeah, it was really about like resources, it was about talent, and it was sort of the general sense that hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could rebuild Slack search in 24 hours if we had to. So that was like the thinking there. Um, really, really nice by the way that Solar Cloud has all this nice infrastructure for like spinning up embedded solar servers and, and Cloudera wrote their MapReduce indexer tool. There was like lots of good examples to go on for how to build these offline solar indexes. Um, Solar Cloud can run out of HDFS. You can serve shards out of HDFS. Um, we opted not to do that, though. We actually used S3 as sort of our primary offline data store for, for shards and segments and stuff like that. Um, the, only, the real kind of decision there was we, we did not have any experience running HDFS as a standalone service. We use EMR for all of our clusters. Uh, we're at AWS shop. Um, didn't really have any experience running HDFS in a production environment. Uh, Basically didn't want to add another moving piece if we didn't have to. We really like S3 a lot, works really, really well. Um, so the way our cluster works is we have a whole bunch of nodes, whole bunch of instances, um, all of the backups and stuff like that are all stored on S3 and we want to deploy a new index. We have a whole bit of code we wrote, and by we I mean John, mainly in Python that just copies data over, loads up the cores and then kind of gets things going. So those are our three big choices. Solar Cloud, building offline indexing pipelines in MapReduce, um, and preferring S3 to HDFS for sort of our large-scale, long-term backup segment store stuff. All right. I'm gonna describe our offline indexing pipeline a little bit. Um, the trick here is we had to migrate an online indexing pipeline. Online indexing, considering one message, one document at a time, entirely in, uh, written entirely in PHP over to a series of MapReduce jobs where it basically was simply not an option to process like one message at a time, it would have taken kind of forever. So we had to translate all of the online PHP-based indexing code to something optimized for an offline batch process written in Java. Um, three steps in this process, uh, the composite dimension job, uh, the doc join, and the actual solar indexer, the scale of the circles there is meant to sort of communicate to a certain extent the amount of time and resources each step takes. Um, First things first, uh, the composite dimension table. Um, the idea here is when we're processing the messages for a team, we need to have 
uh, available to us in a sort of very, very fast way, access to all of the different kind of lookup tables we use in MySQL in the online indexing job. So I need to be able to fetch the row for the user who's the author of the message. I need to be able to fetch information about the channel the message was in. I need to be able, anyone who gets mentioned in the message, I need to be able to fetch their information. Um, any kind of reactees, any kind of like uh, stars, any kind of pins, I basically have to have very fast lookup access to all this information in the job. Um, and the way we do that is we take our MySQL snapshot backups and we run a sort of giant kind of unification job, uh, which takes the individual tables with all their different schemas, um, groups them all together by team, does a big sort of sorting operation, and outputs this data structure that we call the composite dimension, uh, which basically is just like an offline, uh, or I guess it's cached in HDFS, just basically a file where we can quickly load up all of the information about a team uh, into RAM and have access to it when we're processing that team's messages. So that is like its sort of primary job. Give me like all of the different tables, all the context about a particular team, all together in a data structure that I can load up into, in, a, in a RAM very quickly when I need to do lookups. <clears throat> uh, the second step is the doc join job. Um, doc join is, so I used to work at Google. Um, doc join is a, is a Googleism. Um, doc join was the name of a protocol buffer that was like an intermediate output uh, during the like offline indexing process that Google built. Um, I love nothing more than sort of Googleisms and, and so on and so forth. So I, I sort of imported that Googleism into Slack. Um, the doc join is a thrift record, since we primarily use thrift, um, that is a 360 degree view of a message. It contains all of the information you need to turn a message uh, into a solar input document uh, to get it ready for indexing. So for this, uh, the input to this job is we are map reducing over the messages table, um, which is quite large, like tens of billions, I guess, yeah, tens of billions of, of messages inside of this table. Um, we're applying the same team partition sorting structure that I mentioned before, um, with a little twist. Uh, I, I mentioned early on that we had this sort of shingling thing where we like include information from like previous documents in time into like the index we're gonna construct or the, into the document we're gonna construct for a particular message. So I have to replicate that logic in the offline job, which means that when I do the sorting, I can't just partition all the data by team, I need to actually partition it by channel and sort it by time within the channel. So that as the job processes, I always have immediate access to the previous messages in the channel that I can use for indexing. So that's what the team partition sort operation does. It outputs these kind of the data into these blocks of channel data. Um, as the channel blocks proceed, group by time or group by team, and then channel and then time, we load up the corresponding composite dimension information for the team. We have all of the users, all the files, all the information about the team available in memory, uh, and then we basically go through and like gather all of the information we need uh, in order to construct the solar input document for the team. So just go kind of like cherry pick all the information you need from the in-memory cache, stick it on a thrift data structure we call the doc join, and then output it um, back to HDFS. We kind of use HDFS uh, in our EMR clusters like as a caching layer, effectively speaking, like S3 is permanent storage, HDFS is like a fast, very large cache, effectively speaking. All right, um, last but not least, Solar indexing job. We take in the actual doc join record, we turn it into a solar input document, um, we use sort of like some co composite ID sorting, we do some sharding stuff that our online system is aware of, and then we run these gigantic reducer jobs that do nothing but run an embedded solar server and index all of these documents just as fast as they can. Um, do all the indexing kind of locally on the node in EMR, copy the output data to HDFS, again as kind of a caching layer, and then finally copy it out to S3 so that the production system can load it. And that's, that's it. Um, that took maybe, I'm trying to think how many months it took us to actually make this thing work, like all together, like four? Yeah. Some like four right. months, roughly speaking, to make this work. A um, lot of, and this stuff's hard. Like it is straight up difficult to do this. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I mean this job needs to, pro like the output of this job was initially like on the order of 160 terabytes of data. Um, doing that much data in any data pipeline is just gonna be difficult. Search pipelines are kind of like the hardest kind of data pipeline to build in a lot of ways. Um, First and foremost, uh, in order to make this work, we had to do a line-for-line -line, uh, transpile of our PHP indexing code uh, into Java. It was exactly as horrible as it sounds. John did most of it. Um, everyone pour one out for John right now. It's just an absolutely <laughs> terrible thing to do. Uh, the good news is we don't update the indexing code all that often. Uh, it's been relatively easy to keep the two in sync going forward. It hasn't like posed any major problems. Um, yes, there were bugs. Yes, we fixed them. The good news was we could rebuild things quickly enough that it was sort of rarely ever a problem. Um, so we've done that, we've paid the cost of the horrible thing, uh, and it's ended up serving us pretty well. Um, second thing, 
one of the reasons I think it took us so long to do this was we were kind of being penny wise and pound foolish about running these jobs. Um, we started initially doing development in our like dev, against our dev databases and our dev teams. And those teams are relatively small and we could basically run fairly quickly and get an index up and running and like found some bugs and fix things. Um, building the kind of like full on scale production like index cluster took a lot longer just because like essentially for like the third reason which is we encountered like literally every single problem you can run into in building a large scale data pipeline in, in constructing the solar index. So we, we did not do a great job of going from like very small test problem where we could iterate quickly to like enormous frickin' burn the, like boil the ocean kind of problem, re-index all the things. And had I had to do over again, I would have done things kind of in a more staged fashion. I would have had like more incremental steps along the way where we could have discovered some of the problems we discovered in the large system, faster, iterated on them quicker, so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that's hard in doing data pipelines is it's just like, it's not your time, it's like the computer's time, right? Like you're running a giant job on the cluster, the job's just off and running, you can be doing all of your other stuff, and so, Sometimes you don't like think as hard as you should, at least I don't, about how you can iterate faster when it's just like the computer doing work as opposed to you having to do stuff, that kind of thing. Um, every possible thing that can go wrong went wrong. Um, we had records of death, uh, meaning we had like messages where loading the message into RAM would cause an out of memory error because of some weird serialization issue. Um, those channeled sort of block joins for the doc join, a lot of skew issues. There are channels that are populated by bots that have like hundreds of thousands of messages per hour. There are channels that are hardly ever used. So we had fairly massive skew problems. Um, optimizing like RAM usage, CPU usage, um, IO system stuff, like how do we do segment merges? How do we do, how many threads should be devoted to indexing? Uh, how much RAM do these systems need? We had to tune absolutely everything at every step of the pipeline in order to get the kind of performance profile we wanted. That stuff just takes time, right? You just have to run it a whole bunch and find out what happens. Um, TLDR, we, we got it done. We got it done. We run this indexing pipeline roughly every week. Um, it takes about 36 hours altogether to go from like nothing to full index of all of Slack's messages from the snapshot uh, going forward. And uh, yeah, it has generally like served us pretty well, broadly speaking. I don't know. I, that's the, I, I would like to get a few more wins out of it to kind of justify the amount of time we put into it, but, it, but it's generally like served us pretty well. So yeah. Um, with that, I want to hand things back over to John to talk about the online system we ended up constructing. So John, here you go. All right. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. So you just kind of heard a bit about how we, uh, well, the whole, the whole story of basically how we do the offline index. Um, meanwhile, as that offline index is being produced, we're, of course, as you type messages into Slack, uh, indexing them via the uh, initial pipeline using the, the job queue and then onto solar as you heard about kind of in the first few slides. Um, and so I just want to talk about how we combine uh, those offline partitions with those live partitions uh, together into like a single corpus that we allow our customers to, you know, search over. Um, and we do this all like the, the kind of one primary cluster is just like one big cluster. There's over 500 collections in it. There's over 1,500 shards in it. Um, and at that scale, um, like you start kind of like encountering like interesting questions, interesting problems. I hope we have like a lot of time for Q and A at the end, so that way we can kind of like dish about like weird stuff that you encounter in Solar <laughs> when this happens. So yeah. like looking forward to that part. Um, but uh, a few of the things that we had to think about was um, what our sharding strategy should be, um, how uh, we would handle like. Uh, synchronization of updates that happen while the offline pipeline is being built, and what we would do about replication. Um, so uh, one of the fun things to think about when you have a cluster of this size is like, how should you do the sharding strategy? We didn't like have that privilege in the previous world because you know we weren't using Solar Cloud, so we didn't have quite as many knobs to tune or whatever. But now we did, so how are we going to do it? Um, and as I was kind of mentioning before, when a user is querying, we kind of think about uh, that user's accessible documents, even though they're kind of individual, at the, but like at the team perspective. So we could think about either spreading a team's documents over all like 1,000 shards, um, and then we'd get the maximum level of parallelism, but we'd also be like extremely exposed to like any issues going on in any of those nodes and network latency, right? Like, you know, almost certainly if you're querying a thousand nodes, a couple of them are in GC, um, like you're always going to ex experience bad performance. Um, 
and long tail performance. Uh, the other option would be to uh, put everything on a single shard. And while that would maybe solve like the, the, the exposure problem from like a variability perspective, you actually get some variability in terms of like the index sizes similar to what we saw in, in the slides before uh, in, that we had in our legacy architecture. Um, and so like the, I guess like the answer is right, like somewhere in the middle, like one bunny is like not enough and like too many bunnies is just like a whole bunch of scary rodents. Um, but like, you know, like a couple is kind of like the right number. Um, <laughs> and we decided to basically encode that trade-off in this concept called stripes. Um, and this looks a lot like multi-level sharding that you have in the composite ID router. Like composite ID has this thing called, called prefix or prefix bits that allows you to like, you know, basically segment up a, um, a much larger sharded collection. Um, and we tried going that route. Um, we ran into some issues with like really large number of responses back to the overseer exceeding g.max buffer and a few other things that we need to, you know, control from like an application perspective. Um, but we ended up doing something fairly similar, like inspired by that basically, where I, each uh, of these like partitions, um, uh, like the computer partition or each day of live partition is split up into like we have, I think we're running like 32 stripes now. So 32 collections per one of those like time ordered partitions on the major axis. Um, so like for example, if your team, uh, if the hash of your team ID like hash to three, you might be in that like, you know, uh, computed zero to October 1st underscore three, and there might be like two shards really. In fact, there's like 30 or 40 in there. Um, and then uh, when you actually perform a query, you run over that, uh, over that stripe, which is basically an alias containing from each partition the same uh, you know, section of, uh, of collections from that partition. Um, so when you do a query, um, we find out what your stripe number is, and you're essentially querying down that vertical stripe with all of the shards. And then in practice, that turns out to be like about like 30 or 40 shards, so that's kind of your parallelism level, and uh, we found that that works uh, pretty well. Um, another thing that when looking at this diagram, like you might want to consider is, well, okay, so we're about to next week build another computed that will supersede some of these live partitions here, and what happens to any of the modifications that I've made in, in those live partitions? Uh, for example, I might go and edit a message, or I might go like endorse a message by adding a reaction to like, you know, this particular message, which I can do even if that message is several days old. And that, might, <laughs> that update may have occurred while the offline index was being built, so like, how do we catch up to that? Um, and like a standard strategy here, and one that we were initially thinking was, well, we'll just like stuff all those updates onto a queue. We'll process that queue all the way through until like we get to the end, and then it's live and ready to go, right? Um, but we didn't really want to add like another layer of complexity to this already complex system. Um, and uh, we've thought about it, and we realized, well, actually, we can kind of just run a solar query to go figure out what all the updates are that we missed. Um, you know, that were being captured by the in-production stuff uh, if we just keep track of the time spans. So the computed index will be from like the beginning of Slack time until like October 1st or October 2nd or whatever. Um, that will be in turn based on a database snapshot that was taken probably soon after that um, that contains the data that we ran the, um, the MapReduce jobs over. Uh, and then between that time and the time that we start mirroring all of the writes to this new partition that we're in, in the process of getting online uh, is all of the updates that we're missing that might apply to this region. So if the M time, like the update time, is within this region and the original message timestamp is within this region, that is essentially the query of stuff that we've been missing. And so we just kind of page through that query and as soon as we're done, we're live and ready to go, and we switch our aliases over to the, um, the set of computed and subsequent live partitions that you know, comprise like the new live index. Another thing that I want to talk about is replication issues. Um, I see Sean here. He helped us a bunch. Um, <laughs> appreciate it. We, we've made a lot of headway as far as that goes. Um, uh, but you'll see the end of the story <laughs> in a second. Um, we tried various different types of replication. Um, we tried uh, NRT, we tried T-log. Uh, this is all at like 
on Solar 7.1 or 7.2 at the time. Um, we ran into a, a variety of different issues. We'd see like full copies, even in the case of T-Log, which shouldn't really happen, uh, going across the network from, uh, you know, from a replica to a node that had just come up or you know, was down and, and came back up again. Uh, we saw issues uh, where it was like where we had um, problems where both the leader and the replica were both um, like neither one wanted to become the leader and they were both down. Um, we we saw a variety of other kinds of problems where a small like localized issue kind of became a cluster wide issue fairly quickly. Um, and as we were kind of going through this, we kind of realized that we had like a bit of a philosophical difference of with. <laughs> Um, what replication was trying to guarantee and what we actually needed. Like replication uh, is like we want to use solar essentially like as a search index. Like it's not the store of record. It's not this like amazingly consistent like you know thing that could be used as an alternative NoSQL database. We wanted it for search. We have a way of like storing all of our primary data. Like that's what we use MySQL and Vitesse for. Um, we kind of just wanted to, uh, you know, have a system that was like highly available and generally very good at returning search results, um, and we didn't really see kind of replication working for us, especially at our really high write load, which is where we ended up encountering these issues. Um, so, we uh, at one point, um, one of the members of our team was asking, "Hey, okay, well, what happens in the situation where you have, you know, we have replicas in multiple?" Availability zones or whatever, and what happens if there's a disaster and they both go down? And we said, oh, well, you know, of course we would restore from backup. And he was like, really? Do we have that going? Is that ready? Um, and that kind of kind of begged the question, like, well, why aren't just like quickly and automatically and reliably restoring from backups good enough? Um, and we felt like that maybe was actually good enough for us in our use case right now. Um, and so uh, we run just with like a single replica per shard. Um, we use shards.tolerant so that we still return queries even if a sh shard in your particular stripe is down. Um, it turns out that because of our shingling strategy and messages being spread across multiple documents that you still end up you know, getting uh, basically all of your data back anyway. Um, we take regular backups and we're like serious about them. We alert when they don't happen exactly on schedule. Um, and we did a lot of things to make sure that uh, they don't impact the live system at, while you're taking a backup. And finally, uh, we have like an, an, an observer node, kind of this dedicated instance that's making sure that uh, you know if a shard is down that we recover from backup, uh, pulling it from S3 and bringing it live. Uh, which is very similar to our strategy of taking a computed index that's stored in S3 and bringing it back online. So we were able to reuse some of that code. And that was sort of like the last piece of the puzzle um, in terms of like getting the stuff out to production. Uh, so we used to be in a situation where over 50% of our queries took longer than a second. Um, and then as we like quickly kind of went through an A-B experiment and then down to launch, we found that uh, we were able to get you know, less than 7% of queries taking longer than a second. So like we're pretty happy with this result and you know, a lot of it comes from like the parallelism of being able to like use multiple cores at the same time while having your query execute and from the uniformity of performance that we get from being able to like spread, uh, you know, a team's documents out across multiple nodes. Um, and uh, you know, but we, like, that wasn't like enough. Um, we had like this new sandbox that we could play around in um, where uh, you know, like we could make the index kind of whatever we wanted, uh, you know, within a, a week's time. So uh, we ended up trying, we playing around with um, uh, sort on the index and got a lot of success with that. So we use like an index sort. Um, we started adding new fields to every single message so that uh, we would have like a more efficient FQ. Um, we uh, worked with a Japanese customer on like three different tokenization strategies for like for their uh, for their documents, and like we're able to show them how that would infect like their entire corpus like every time. So we went through that nice like fast iteration that worked out really successfully. Um, and like even you know over the past couple of days, we've heard like a lot of like really great ideas that we kind of can't wait to incorporate. Um, so yeah, we have like this cool. Um, you know, like sandbox this fun system to play around in. 
Uh, if that sounds like something that might be interesting to you, <laughs> uh, you hint, know, hint. we're hiring. Yeah. Um, so, you know, take that under consideration. Um, but yeah, it's been like a really kind of fun road for us to, uh, to figure all this stuff out. And we've learned like all kinds of things over the, along the way. So if you have any questions about any of this stuff that uh, you heard, um, yeah, sure, please. Uh, a previous message of the Slack, right? It gets updated whenever a news file is added or any comment app gets added. Mm -hmm. So how do you update the document? And in Solar or you've seen every update that you make, it generates a deleted document. So how do you cope up with that? Uh, so the question is basically, there are lots of edits that can happen to a Slack message. Um, we send updates to them. Every update is like, in fact, a delete. How do you deal with that? And the answer is, um, as like, you know, as well as we can. Um, one of the things, uh, actually, let me go back past through to the appendix. Okay, sweet. So, okay, so here's like the computed index is like really large in terms of number of shards, and then the hot edge is the one that's at the bottom, and that's the one that's taking the most updates. Uh, and those, that's, um, that index is like really, really small because it only contains about a day's worth of data. So the segments in there are like really tiny. Um, it is like really, uh, it, it processes updates really, really quickly because it doesn't have really much else to do. Um, so by like balancing that load essentially uh, across the cluster, like the vast majority of updates are going to occur on messages that were sent in that same day. Um, and so by tuning the hot edge, that's one of the nice things that like this kind of bifurcated partitioning system allows us to do. Uh, we can tune this and we can like, you know, increase the number of shards um, on, on that hot edge if we want to, if we're running into trouble. Along those lines, we never optimize, ever. Um, we, we optimize in the computed job. Like the computed job effectively is garbage collection in a lot of ways. There is no optimize ever on the lives. We need all of the CPU basically to be doing nothing but indexing messages and handling the queries and stuff like that. So yeah, like that's sort of like, Optimize merge segment operations are all done by the offline job. That is its purpose, like garbage collection. Yeah. So how frequently do you uh, soft commit for data? Uh, for recent messages, we soft commit, is it 30, 30. seconds, right? Um, for older, so not for nothing, 99% um, of all updates to a Slack message happen within the first 10 minutes of the message's existence. Almost all messages older than that never see any changes. So for the computed index, uh, we actually only soft commit, I think, every couple of minutes. Like, we don't need to soft commit that frequently just because updates to it are, are relatively rare. Yeah, so those actually run under slightly different So like configs. the computed is almost treated almost, like almost as read-only as humanly possible, whereas the lives are like right, 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 almost all the time. Yeah, that's a great question. Please, yeah. Um, so question about your shimming approach. Um, so, you know, say a message <coughs> got uh, created um, as message three, um, mm -hmm. when you index it, message one, two, and three together, Yeah. right? What happens when message one got edited, do you then go back and update message you do. three? You do, yeah, exactly. Okay, so the, the shingling kind of works in both ways then, right? Um, I'm afraid so. Your two parents yes. and you'll take care of your children. Yeah, the, the shingling was a, uh, a feature that was added by our CEO, this guy Stuart Butterfield, who is, he's like very passionate about it working this way. Um, I actually argued against it for a lot of reasons, because it caused a whole bunch of, sh of skew scale right. problems and stuff like that. So we have a few exceptions to it. Um, for instance, the idea of shingling is to capture like conversation. Um, bot messages, for instance, are not conversations. Bots aren't aware of other messages, so bot messages do not get shingled. There's also like a 24 hour limit if the message occurred more than like a day ago, like don't shingle it, like that kind of stuff. So there are a couple of exceptions to it. But yeah, you're right. In the case of like a message being edited, it's not just one document that needs to get updated, it's three documents that need to get updated. Totally, yeah. In the back. How, how do you monitor this? such a big, uh, Number of shards oh. and those, uh, collections. Ah, well, this is, I would actually love the, like if you clicked yeah. on cloud in like the solar admin UI, I'd love it to see to show this. <laughs> right. um, like this view is designed to show like a thousand things at once. Um, uh, and you know, uh, they'll change color or whatever. So it's easy to get a good overview. Um, but we, we use paging, like, you know, like we use PagerDuty. We have like alerts for very specific things, whether backups are being taken on time. We run synthetic searches all the time just to make sure that those are always succeeding. Um, we, uh, We're a big Prometheus shop, not yeah, for nothing. We, I mean, it's, it's Grafana on top of Prometheus, like monitoring kind of everything, all the major node metrics, all the system metrics from the perspective of our web application, from the perspective of the nodes themselves. 
Yeah, we have like helper processes that are running alongside of each node. There's like the observer, that's the one that's like doing the onlining, the core onlining. These are written in Python, by the way. Um, there's a core manager, this is a Python process that sits next to every single solar node of all the solar nodes that we have in our cluster. And it does like a little bit of, um, you know, baseline stuff. It manages doing the backups on every core in that node. Um, and it does like additional alerting and other things. Um, and then uh, the collection manager itself also is always looking for down cores. Um, and I think we're about out of time. So if you have any other questions, come and come hang out with us. us. Yeah, um, totally. But thanks for thanks standing for by with everybody. us. <laughs> Thank you very much.